Games have always been about progress and improvement. In almost every game, your playable character is on a journey for a goal. On this journey, you as a player and your character improve your skills. You get stronger, faster, cleverer, and most commonly, you are victorious in the end. It is no surprise that the GTA series, as one of the most successful game series of all time, also focuses on this narrative approach. However, in contrast to other games, it focuses on rather grim topics like gangsters, vengeance and crime, in combination with freedom as the series' main focus. Inspired by the gangster subgenre, the developers took the concept of the American dream and they combined it with a playable character who strives for more by being an outlaw. Since 1997, the games have been a satirical take on the American dream and the American society. Since I was seven years old, I have been playing and loving the series without really reflecting on what was presented to me. In this video, I will turn back the clock as to have a look at the main titles of the GTA series and what they represented. Therefore, I divided this video into four parts, which will focus on the general concept of the American dream, the violent freedom of Grand Theft Auto, unconventional gangster stories, and the American nightmare. So without further ado, let's start. The American dream is dead. Similar to many books, films and games, also the GTA series mainly focuses on the concept of the American dream. The founding father of the idea of the American dream was James Truslow Adams, who coined the phrase in his 1931 bestseller, The Epic of America. The American dream is that dream of a land in which life should be better, richer and fuller for everyone, with opportunity for each according to ability or achievement. We can give everyone in this country a fair chance at that great American dream. It is not a dream of motor cars and high wages merrily, but a dream of social order in which each man and each woman shall be able to attain to the fullest stature of which they are naturally capable, and be recognized by others for what they are, regardless of the fortuitous circumstances of birth or position. That's what it means, that's the American dream. In other words, make your dreams come true. Find yourself and do your thing without somebody telling you what to do. Just do it! Make your dreams come true! Clearly a contrast to the European medieval asset-based society. Birth, family, class or status shall not define the path you take in life. This might be the basic principle of the American dream. Nowadays, the dream has been transformed and connected to wealth. At least as a rich man, when I have to face my problems, I show up in the back of a limo wearing a $2,000 suit and a $40,000 gold fucking watch. For many, the pursuit of happiness has become the pursuit for money even at the expense of others. Being rich has become the ultimate goal of success in life. The GTA series as a whole is an ultimate comment to the American dream and what it has become. Right from the start you had a sandbox playground in which you could do whatever you wanted. However, money has always played an essential part of the gameplay, as your money supply is always shown in your interface. In GTA 1 it is still masked as a score, but in GTA 2 you see that it is your money that grows when you commit atrocities. The two games were advertised as satirical takes on modern society that might hold up a mirror to the player's hidden brutality and urge for growing digits. However, with the interface, design and gameplay, there was actually no other way to play it. Therefore, it was a criticism of the degradation of the American dream. As to quote, modeled on the apocalyptic visions of the future from the 1970s and 1980s, the city for GTA 2 is a fully dysfunctional urban hell. Like all cities, it has fully international flavor and each different group in the city wants to control something. However, for me and my friends, at that time, the GTA series offered a digital space in which you could indulge in brutal fantasies as to return to society as a balanced individual. For me, there was nothing thought-provoking or critical to it. It was just fun to steal cars and run rampant. I liked the game not because it reflected reality, I liked it because I felt that it contradicts reality. 
So the satire didn't really work for me at that time. In GTA 3 they set this sandbox world into the third dimension. The developers got rid of the direct rewarding for atrocities, but the interface still shows the amount of money you own. You could only earn money in Liberty City if you do something for someone. The playable character doesn't really have a backstory nor a name as to allow the player to fill this void. Again the player might choose how to play the game. You could steal cars and run rampant once more, you could work as a police officer, firefighter or taxi driver, or you could complete missions for the city's underworld. If you choose to do that, you get to know various strange characters with interesting backstories. As the money reward at the end of the mission might support a certain feeling of promotion and as you might want to see how the story continues, there's a high chance that you keep on completing the missions until you see the credits rolling. The game's antagonist is Catalina, the former girlfriend of the main character who betrayed him during a bank heist. Sorry babe, I'm an ambitious girl. You're just small time. At the end of the main story, you help the main character to kill Catalina in her helicopter and the credits roll. The story of GTA 3 felt a little basic. You took revenge, you got a lot of money because you did jobs for crazy people and in the end you could not really do anything with it. So spurred by the success of GTA 3, Rockstar Games used the engine to produce two more games which this time put more focus on a story. Vice City is 24 karat gold these days. We send someone down to cut ourselves a nice slice. It is pretty obvious that the main inspiration for Vice City's story was the movie Scarface from 1983. Similar to Tony Montana, Tommy Versetti also starts off as an ambitious guy who wants to become a big shot in the city. Similar to GTA 3, the plot also revolves around taking revenge. In Vice City, the main antagonist is Sonny Ferrelli, an Italian-American mobster who set a trap for Tommy at the beginning of the game which led to his incarceration for 15 years. Similar to Tony, also Tommy uses illegal ways to accumulate huge amounts of money after being released in Vice City. And also Tommy has to face Sonny Ferrelli at the end of the game. So Tommy, what was the big plan? You think I just take the fake cash, save face and run away with my tail between my legs? No, I just wanted to piss you off before I kill you. In Scarface, Tony fails to defeat the opposing drug cartel and he's killed eventually. The storyline refers to the tragic nature of a traditional gangster film that presents a steady upward progress followed by a very precipitate fall. Not only in Scarface but also in other gangster flicks, the audience can experience the exciting, sinful, greedy and selfish lifestyle of a criminal without lifting a finger. For a period of time, the viewer may imagine to be in the shoes of the protagonist. As Warshaw puts it, he is what we want to be and what we are afraid we may become. The subconscious approval of the gangster's success in life creates a dilemma for good citizens in the audience. According to Warshaw, the eventual death of the gangster resolves this dilemma. The gangster dies for the audience at the end as to encourage their trust in justice once more before they leave the cinema. In comparison to a gangster film, a gangster game like GTA Vice City does not follow Warshow's principles. After Tommy Vesetti's steady upward progress, he also faces his superior in his villa. However, he is able to defeat him and he ends up being in charge of business and the credits roll. It means Tommy, baby! What do you think it means? That we're in charge. I mean, I mean that you're in charge. Oh, Tommy! You know, Ken, I think this could be the beginning of a beautiful business relationship. After all, you're a conniving, backstabbing, two-bit thief, and I'm a convicted psychotic killer and drug dealer. <laughs> I know. Ain't it just beautiful? In contrast to its inspiration, the game refuses to kill its main character at the end. And in contrast to a gangster film, you do not only watch the criminal in action, 
You are the criminal. As you start the game, you take control over Tommy Vesati's actions. The overall plot and his development is defined to a certain degree, but you as the player have a different connection to Tommy in relation to Tony. If the developers had decided to kill Tommy at the final showdown, it might have disappointed many players after investing so much time in advancing his criminal career. By ending the game, with a victorious gangster, the developers dare to present an immoral version of the rags to riches concept. It can be seen as a satirical take on the American dream, a protest against the generic gangster film or an attempt to satisfy secret desires of the player. Also in GTA San Andreas we can see a similar concept. The sandbox idea was extended further with more vehicles available for the player. Furthermore, the game enabled additional customization of the main character CJ. Also elements of role-playing games were implemented so you could choose to train him. The game focused on a Rex to riches story once more, which was inspired by California within the 1990s. Therefore, its main focus are social injustice, gang violence and police brutality. CJ as the main protagonist has to deal with these problems as an African American from the lower class growing up in the hood of Los Santos. Hey! A baller's posse's about to run up! They're headed up here right now! Looks like we backed them ballers against the wall, huh? Hey CJ, strap up! Scroll Street! Quite fittingly, the main antagonist is Officer Tenpenny, who plays CJ like a fiddle right from the start of the game. In contrast to the previous antagonist, Tenpenny personifies the legal criminal that uses the unjust system as a cover. After CJ enters Los Santos, Tenpenny explains to him that they will frame him for the murder of a fellow cop if he refuses to work for them. When we want you, we'll find you. In the meantime, try not to gun down any more officers of the law. <laughs> Doing job after job for mobsters, the police and other clients, CJ is able to move up in the world. Owning a business in San Fierro, a stake in a casino and a mansion. Hey man, we off to our new spot. We got a mansion, sweet. We've been putting in work and shit is going well. We got a stake in the casino. We got some insane shit in Fierro. We get into the rap game. Hey man. Let me get you some new clothes, come on! New clothes? Nigga, what the fuck is this bullshit? In the end, CJ and his brother defeat Tenpenny and restore justice in Los Santos. Their family is victorious and rules over the strongest gang in Los Santos. They got money, respect, influence and most importantly, with Tenpenny dead, CJ has regained his freedom. See you around, officer. Similar to Vice City, the player might feel victorious at the end. However, in contrast to Tommy, CJ is not only obliged to rebel against treacherous gangsters, but also against the legal system that is deeply influenced by corruption. In other words, if you perform criminal acts in an unjust society, you do not really feel evil. CJ and therefore also the player might feel more like a freedom fighter and less like a brutal hitman. Bro, Far out, man. You know, I mean, you beat the system. I tried for 30 years to cross over, but you managed it, man. I mean, man, you're an icon, man. Oh, thanks, man. Again, we have a satisfied gangster at the end and a story that disregards Warshow's principles of the gangster film. In 2008, Grand Theft Auto 4 was determined to present something different to the players. Of course, the game still featured sandbox freedom with even more opportunities, but instead of presenting a flashy and comical world, it focused more on realism. Similar to Nolan's Dark Knight from the same year, the game used dark colors and settings as to capture the feeling of a concrete metropolis that promises opportunities. Like the previous titles, the Rex to Riches storyline incorporated in the American Dream appear to be obligatory. The game introduces Niko Balik, a Serbian veteran who fought during the Yugoslav Wars. He takes a boat to Liberty City as to start a new life similar to millions of Europeans before him. In addition to that, he is driven by revenge similar to the main characters in the previous GTA titles. We're all looking for that special someone. 
I need to know what's happened. Give me that. For 10 years, I've been searching. I need this for you. I guarantee that you will find this man. This time his and therefore also the player's main goal is to find Darko Brevich. Darko betrayed Nico's unit during the war which led to an ambush of enemy forces and the death of 15 men, mostly friends from Nico's hometown. From this exposition the course of the story was clear for a GTA fan like me. Like in the previous titles I would do jobs for the underworld of Liberty City and kill anyone that is in my way and after that I would get to Darko who had already become a kingpin gangster. I would be the modern knight of light and justice who would punish the dark Darko for his crimes in an epic showdown. Well, since you put it that way, I mean. So again, I did everything the underworld bosses and crooked officials wanted me to do. And I was rewarded with money, status and more opportunities. So when the time came and the call, I made sure to put on the nicest suit I had as to show that I made it in America. I equipped the best weapons I had as there would be a final showdown with a final enemy. But what I saw in that mission changed my perspective. You remember me? I don't know you. Yes, you do. I'm the one who survived. The evil Darko Brevich is just a miserable poor guy who betrayed Nico and his friends as to get a thousand dollars to finance his addiction. Without question he's a bad and selfish person and it is even more strange that a thousand dollars were enough to sell off his friends. But by asking how much do you charge to kill someone? He holds up a mirror not only to Nico who has received high amounts of money for killing people, but also to me, who has done this for 10 years already. How was Darko different from Nico, or from me playing Nico the whole time? He even resembles a version of Nico that arrived in Liberty City at the start of the game. At this point, the game sadistically gives you the choice either to kill him or to spare him, which created a dilemma both in Nico and in me. As there is no distinct difference between Nico and Darko, killing Darko would have been equal to Nico shooting himself. In this case, his self-proclaimed idea of justice would have failed as to reveal his and the player's own selfishness. However, the consequence of sparing Darko would have been absurd nevertheless, due to the fact that it was Nico's key purpose to defeat his foe. Similar to GTA 3, GTA Vice City and GTA San Andreas. All of the in-game efforts Nico had made and atrocities he had committed would have been pointless. I felt that the game was talking to me directly in this moment and it took me a relatively long time before I made a move. You fucking hypocrite. Trust me. You're doing me a favor. Ah! I came to the conclusion that Nico has to spare Darko because for me this meeting led to the understanding that the cause of his actions are deeply wrong and misguided. He got traumatized during the war in which he learned to kill at a young age and had to experience the death of his friends. And his quest for vengeance only created a massive trail of blood that led him to the point where he does not look in the eyes of his nemesis he only sees his miserable reflection. It was not only hard for Nico to accept this unrewarding outcome, but also for me as a player, it was hard to deal with this. I want to end the game at this point, but it was not the last mission, so I wasn't sure whether to finish the game. In contrast to Vice City or San Andreas, there was no happy ending possible for Nico in my opinion. Also, the developers refused to serve us a happy ending for GTA 4. Whatever decision you make, Either Nico's cousin Roman or his alleged love interest will die as a consequence. And everything that you do again is to take revenge once more. She's dead! Oh shit! 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 She told me to leave it. I thought I had. I thought it was over. It's never over, Aya. The victory in both endings is presented as very questionable and unsatisfying. 
Welcome to America. Speak English. You're a strange man. You killed your best friend. You betrayed everyone who ever came in contact with you. You killed my cousin. I guess the survival of the fittest thing really meant a lot to you. We won, man. We won! So this is what the dream feels like. This is the victory we longed for. From the time Nico meets Darko, the downfall of the story begins that fits a more traditional gangster flick. The fact that he does not die in the end actually complements his misery. He has to live with his sorrow, regret and grief within an American nightmare. While introducing the downfall to the series, the developers changed my perspective on their games. With its message that opposes the modern concept of the American dream, it fitted to the zeitgeist of a world that stuck in a severe financial crisis. From that point, there appeared to be no turning back anymore. You ruined me, you fuck! In 2013's GTA V came across as a medley of the previous titles personified by the three main characters. There's Trevor, representing the vulgar crazy person I became in GTA 1, 2 and 3. A friend. I mean, things could get really messy. There's Michael DeSanta, representing Tommy Vercetti with his mansion and race standard of living that I worked for in GTA Vice City. Surprisingly, he's not happy about the American dream either. This shit, oh, I'm living a dream, baby. And that dream is fucked. It is fucking fucked. And there's Franklin representing CJ and GTA San Andreas, starting off in the ghetto again, dreaming of becoming rich. Yeah, I sound like somebody trying to make some paper and not get keyed. Oh, my bad, Mr. Gold Card. Courtesy of a hundred feet. Got my prints and essays all week. However, this time the ultimate goal of doing job after job as to accumulate more and more cash appears to be contradictory as Michael DeSanter, who is living the common dream, is not happy. The dream of the ultimate heist is the dream that all three characters and maybe also the player share. Anyway, we uh, robbed and lied and we hurt people. Pretty much lived a low-life kind of existence. but. Always dreaming of one thing and one thing only. The big one. The big one. The, the big, big one. one! What is the big one? <laughs> the Union Depository. Around 200 million in gold bricks, all taken from kindly Uncle Sam, who will spend the rest of our lives being hunted by government officials if we live through the attempt. But, but it'll be my, uh, our masterpiece. With GTA 4 as a predecessor, it presents an immoral and comedic world that digs even deeper in the source code of the American dream, mostly Thomas Jefferson's idea of the pursuit of happiness. The game clearly shows that money cannot be the source of happiness. And it is also not the common concept of living a good life. The American dream is highly individual. It might be the love for movies and happy ends, the desire to do whatever you want to do without following the social norms, the hope to escape a system of injustice, or the thrill to experience something dangerous and extraordinary. Similar to GTA 4, there are two endings that come close to the ending of a traditional gangster flick, with the difference that you as a player decide which character has to experience the ultimate downfall. You can choose to kill Trevor or Michael as to finish the game, with an unhappy ending, but in a sense you could feel that justice was served.
I take a fucking shot! No, I trusted you. I took you in. Treated you like family. In contrast to GTA 4, you can also help your characters to work as a team as to deal out blows to the alleged modern bad guys. We only just begun to clean this shit up. We got a lot of old friends I think need to be re-educated. A lot of friends. I mean, things could get really messy. No, we just gotta silence a few noisy people. You can kill Stretch as a representation of gang violence. You can kill Steve Haynes as a representation for corrupt law enforcement. Oh my god! The guy! What's his name? He shot him! You kill Wei Cheng as a representation for drug commerce and Chinese influence on the US. And finally, there is Devin who pulls the strings in Los Santos and probably also the whole nation as a multi-billion dollar business tycoon, member of the wealthy 1% lizard people elite. Or be a billionaire who even the president lets finger his wife. Before killing him, the group even lectures him on the problem of modern capitalism. There's two great evils that bedevil American capitalism, the type that you practice. Number one is outsourcing. You paid a private company to do your dirty work for you. And then you underpaid that company because you thought you were big enough and bad enough that you didn't have to play by the rules. Oh, number two, offshoring your profits. Offshoring? Oh, it's horrible. You wouldn't want to be sent offshore just to save a little money, would you, T? Oh, no, Franklin? I wouldn't. Oh, no, I ain't would you going want? nowhere. No, see, but we know your opinions on the matter, Devin. Keep your problems the fuck out of America, huh? <laughs> In this instance, when he puts it like that, it makes sense. Again, the main characters and you finish the path of criminality, not only by taking revenge, but also by liberating the American society. This ending is as comical as it is hypercritical, but it feels good and redemptive. Oh, that's perfect. Then we can get back to the kind of capitalism we practice. Shit, I don't know how much more better that is than Devin's con. Ooh, hypocrisy, Franklin. Civilization's greatest virtue. Jesus, your therapist has a lot to answer for. So far, the ending of GTA V has been the conclusion for the series for me. The bottom line of a story that illustrates the perverted, extreme and strange American dream in a postmodern world. A dream that connects money to happiness, taking the survival of the fittest idea into society while rewarding the most brutal and merciless with the feeling of making it. Since their first game, the developers presented this idea over and over again while changing its form, narrative and presentation. Right from the start, the developers ridiculed the tropes of a common gangster story only to adopt these tropes as interactive parts of their games later on. In a way, the GTA games appear as dumb and childish, but there is a certain cleverness and wisdom in every title that is hidden behind a facade of vulgar and flashy entertainment. In contrast to other artists, the developers managed to get your attention due to the fact that their games are not boring. As one of the most successful game series of all time, they have a great impact on society, maybe even more than the rather traditional media. In its weird style, each game tries to hold up a mirror to our society, economy, way of life and also to the players themselves. In this mirror you might see your urge to strive for more, your demand for freedom and punishment for its oppressors, the confrontation with your own miserable reflection, and the understanding that happiness cannot be defined by community, the media or your family, but only by yourself.